Good morning. This, as you can see from the screen, is session four of our seven-act play, which means if you include the Q&A sessions, when we're finished with this, we have finally made it to halfway through. Please stick around for the second half. You've seen this slide before. This is from the point of view of when you're trying to get a patent, what in heaven's name is the U.S. Patent Office going to think is important. Last month, we looked at the first two of these, what kinds of things are and are not patentable, and what in heaven's name is prior art. Today, I'm going to move on to the other two things that the Patent Office will look at, and we'll look at at least some of them very hard. First off, is what you're trying, trying to claim obvious? Because if it is, the Patent Office won't give you a patent. And the second is really focused on that application that you sent in. Is it a good application? Does it do what it's supposed to do to meet some of the statutory requirements for that piece of paper? Once again, I'm not trying to make anybody into a patent attorney, and I assume 99 and 44, 100% of you don't want to be patent attorneys. But I'd like to give you some idea of the things to keep in mind when you're trying to decide what to do, where to take your company, and whether or not a patent might be worthwhile. Let me take a couple of quick diversions. First, we talked about software patents last time. Since we last met, the European Patent Office has issued some new guidelines. I mentioned last month that the U.S. and Europe didn't face things in exactly the same way, and that remains the case. The U.S. cases, as you'll recall, they seem to draw a line between simply using a computer to do something and improving the way a computer operates. The latter, making the computer work better, is clearly patentable anywhere. But in Europe, if you look at this two hurdles approach that they're talking about, it's fairly clear that you can get claims that have a lot more computer, excuse me, and a lot more software, what they refer to as a non-technical in them. They'll give you claims concerning a computer implemented invention, which is where we ran into trouble, or you'll run into trouble in the US. Method claims, product claims, data signals, types of things that you'd have a very difficult time patenting here, but keep in mind that Europe is different because, among other things, it's a very big market. I'd also like to stop on some, and I said rough statistics, because you'll find different statistics depending on how much stuff you want to read on online. But the important thing here is look at the number of patents that issued last year, 350,000. Then look at two other numbers. How many patent infringement suits were filed last year? Fraction over 5,000. The patent offices we'll get into later will look at a patent again in some circumstances after it's been issued a so-called post-grant review. How many of those were there? Fewer than 400. What does that tell you? It tells you that the most important thing is to get your patent because only about 2% of the patents at issue are ever going to be challenged. Second thing it tells you is if you're challenged, if you look at the district court and federal circuit numbers and the patent office post-grant review numbers, your patent may well be in trouble. District courts only find about 25% of the patents before them to be both valid and infringed. That's great if you're a defendant. It's not so good if you're patent, a patentee. And in the patent office on these post-grant reviews, the odds for a patentee are even worse. Only 20% of patents sent back to the patent office that it looks at come out with all of their claims are patentable. A couple of potential insights out of this, and I'm not sure where the numbers take you. How many of those 350,000 patents at issue are really important? 
How many of them will people use? How many of them, if you're the patentee, will even you use? Remember we had a slide two or three sessions ago that came out of a European study that said the vast majority of patents aren't worth the money you spent on them. Make, try to choose the ones that do. You're never going to be right, but take a hard look and see if they will be. Which ones are important? Which ones are eventually commercialized? Which ones might anybody else other than you really care about? So now let's get to obviousness. This is section 103 of the Patent Act. It starts off with you can't get a patent even if what you're claiming is not identically disclosed. What does that mean? It means it's not in and of itself part of a single piece of prior art. If there's any difference between the prior art and what you've claimed, the prior art does not, quote, identically disclose what you're trying to claim. Okay, you got over that first hurdle. Do you get a patent? No, according to the statute. If the differences between what you claimed and the prior art, your pen has red ink in it as opposed to my blue prior art pen, are such that the invention as a whole, what you've claimed, would have been obvious. Would have been obvious when? Remember prior art? It's before the effective filing date of what you're trying to claim. To whom? To somebody having ordinary skill in the art to which the invention pertains. <clears throat> I can't give you a clean answer as to when is something going to be or not going to be obvious. In the patent office's view, in a judge's view, in a post-grant review, or frankly in the view of a licensee who wants to pay you a lot less money than you're asking for. The answer depends on facts. It depends on the way the people who are marshalling and examining those facts think. What do they think of what the idea is, the differences are, are they important? In terms of the differences, one way I found maybe useful to look at it is don't simply focus on the difference, plural, between you and the prior art. Ask yourself the question, what difference do those <coughs> differences make? In terms of the person of ordinary skill, think of them as sitting in a room with all of the relevant art hanging on the wall behind them or around them. The question that the examiner will ask, that a judge or jury will ask, that a patent reviewer after the fact will ask, is given all of that, and as I said, the examiner won't find anywhere near all of it, a later lawsuit will find a lot more, would it be obvious to a person working in the field? One question that comes up is, how important is this person having ordinary skill in the art? What's well, always mentioned in the decisions, my impression over the years, it is really not extraordinarily important in the vast, vast majority of cases. Depending on which side of the patent you are, if you're the patentee, you want that person of ordinary skill to be really stupid. They wouldn't think of anything. And there actually are some old cases, I remember one dealing, I believe, with plows in which the judge looked at all of the old patents and said, in substance, you know, there ain't a whole heck of a lot of skill in the people who got these patents. And there's got to be at least that much behind yours. And if these are valid, yours has to be valid too. On the other hand, if you're trying to defeat a patent, you want the person of ordinary skill to be really versed in that field. If you're in a bio field, you want somebody with a PhD, and you want somebody in a PhD in precisely the subject matter of the patent that's before you. Usually there's not too much of a fight about this. But the idea is when there gets to be a situation in which how intelligent, how trained, how much experience does this ordinary person have, in a few cases, it will make a difference. Why do we have an obviousness requirement? <clears throat> 
Well, basically, what we want to do is try to weed out insignificant changes. Supreme Court, for a long time, has said the purpose of the patent laws is to reward people who make a substantial discovery, not on everything. That's the Atlantic Works Brady, 1882. You get to 1950, and the Supreme Court steps in again. If you've got a combination, and remember, most patents do consist of combinations of old bits and pieces. If all it does is unite old things and doesn't change things, well, the court says that withdraws what's already known in the field into the monopoly. I think of this as sort of a toolbox. The person sitting in the room with all of the prior art hanging on the wall, those are her tools. And the Supreme Court is taking the view that they are entitled to be able to use all of these tools if all of those tools basically just continue what they're doing. You may add more tools on the part you're building, but if they're only old tools and they don't change what they're doing, that is not going to be patentable. Neither are we going to permit patents on what we expect people to do what the court called the results of ordinary innovation. Supreme Court is obviously afraid of limiting what smart people, and maybe my not so smart person of ordinary skill might do, and doesn't want to impinge on their ability to do it. Most of the rest of the world doesn't talk in terms of obviousness. They require, and we'll get into it a little more later, what's called an inventive step, and in many ways they really aren't very different. Obviousness goes back to at least 1851. This case, don't read it, it involved, you got a doorknob. What are you going to make the handle out of? Handles had been made out of wood or metal. Somebody decided, gee, there's now great porcelain around or glass, let's make a glass or porcelain handle and get a patent on it. And they got a patent on it. Supreme Court didn't think much of the patent, and the way they didn't think much about it is interesting to look at. What the court required here long before the current patent acts was this to be patentable had to require more ingenuity and skill than the ordinary mechanic, person of ordinary skill in that art, had. If not, it's simply the work of a mechanic, and it's not important. That level of what's required to be patentable was not changed by the 103 Act. And that was one of the important insights or reasons that Graham v. Deere was important. Graham v. Deere was the first act, excuse me, the first Supreme Court case after the 52 Act. Supreme Court very much wanted to come out with a unanimous statement, and my understanding is that the only way they got unanimity was to put in, we did not lower the level of patentable invention. A lot of people hoped they had this quashed that hope. If you read old cases, old texts or anything, you'll find that before 1952, you'll never find the word obviousness because it showed up for the first time in the 1952 Act. What were the sort of simile, similar words used? Patentable novelty or maybe invention? Words that frankly don't tell you a whole heck of a lot more than obvious. So here's Graham V. Deere. What did it do? What it tried to do was to give a framework for deciding whether something is obvious. And it gave a really three basic steps. What's the prior art really teach? What are the differences between the claimed invention and the prior art? And hopefully it's more than simply the color of ink in my pen. Third, because it's in the statute, what is the level of skill of the ordinary person in the field? And last, and this is where things tend to get a little more interesting, maybe, there are so-called 
secondary considerations of non-obviousness that the Supreme Court had mentioned in passing and somebody wrote a 1964 learned article in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review that went back to them and the Supreme Court picked up that law review. Who called it to their attention? Who knows? But these five things are supposed to give you some insight into whether or not a claimed invention is obvious. I'll ask you whether they really do. The one that is always bandied about is commercial success. Well, a lot of things are commercially successful that nobody would call an invention. And if you don't believe it, look at all of the advertisements for children's toys that are on television this time of the year. A lot of things can contribute to commercial success that have absolutely nothing to do with the quality of the technology or the jump forward in technology that went into them. And for that reason, the courts are now requiring what they call some type of nexus between the commercial success and what the patent claimed. The second and third actually might have something to do with it, obviousness. If people had tried to do this before and were unable to do so, it probably is fair to draw the conclusion that the way to accomplish what they'd been trying to do wasn't obvious. Long felt need is a little more on the borderline because what it kind of assumes is that there were a long felt need, but that all of those tools hanging around the room were already there. If there had been a need for thousands of years to go to the moon, when were the tools available that finally made that possible? In looking at long-term need, it's not just has the need been there for a long term, but has the information needed to solve that need been around? Copying is always important. Gee, you copied this thing. Of course I did. It was a commercial success and I really wanted to get money. Copying could also mean I had to copy because I couldn't figure out any other way to do it. But there are two sides of the coin and if you're trying to decide whether what you're doing is really patentable, whether your patent is valid, or frankly whether the patent of somebody who's suing you is valid, take all of these into consideration. Did you copy? Yeah, you may have had a good reason to. And it may have nothing to do with whether that pat your patent or anybody else's is obvious. And finally, and it's probably the most important, at least in the patent office, is unexpected results. Did this claimed invention do something that was totally unexpected by anybody who was really working in the area? The next important Supreme ca ca Court case, believe it or not, is over 40 years later. From 66 to 76, the Supreme Court decided a number of obviousness cases. And in all but one of them, it said the patent's invalid. Then for 31 years, they didn't look at any. Fair question, why? And the answer is the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit was established in 1982 to try to bring some uniformity into patent decisions. Before it was established, if I had a case, patent case here in the U.S. court in Massachusetts, the appeal went to the First Circuit. If it was in San Francisco, it went to the Ninth Circuit. So you had, I think the number is still, 13 different circuits, each of which heard appeals from different geographic areas and which were not consistent in the way they worked them out. I think the rubric is there's one circuit that hadn't decided a patent was valid in heaven knows how many years, and there's one that never decided a patent that was valid. Over the years, the Pat Federal Circuit became known as a patent-friendly court, much more so than any of the prior circuits had been. I think it's fair to say that it, one of the way the patent office, patent, excuse me, the Federal Circuit saw its charter was not only to bring unanimity to the patent decisions, but also to strengthen the patent decision. But maybe they became a little too patent friendly because in 2007, Supreme Court 
looked back and got into obviousness again. And it really rejected what it saw as an approach of the federal circuit that was far too rigid. Far too rigid in what ways? Far too rigid in what it required before it would find something that was obvious. They had a very narrow conception of what might make something obvious. They looked at what was the patentee's motivation or purpose and said, no, this isn't it. What matters is what's overall taught to anybody. What's the objective reach of the claim? What does that claim cover? And most important, if that claim covers anything that's obvious, even though it may cover a lot of things, including what's specifically taught in the patent, the particular thing you show that's not obvious, the claim is, val is invalid. A claim cannot be valid and still cover obvious subject matter. Be careful when you write them. Supreme Court also rejected what I'll call some of the more particulars and rigidity that the Federal Circuit had. Federal Circuit had really required that the prior art effectively lead the horse to water. It wasn't enough that the horse was thirsty and could perhaps smell it off in the distance. Somebody had to get off and lead the man skilled in the art and show him precisely where in the prior art everything was taught. They said there had to be specific findings on how that particular knowledge, specific things mentioned in the prior art, would have motivated people who were trying to accomplish what the patentee did to do what the patentee did. And the fact that it might be obvious to try this because it's got a good chance of success was never enough. Supreme Court, not surprisingly, didn't really like that view. KSR, starting in 2007 and running really until the present day, has created and set forth the two, really two questions that are key for a court or an examiner deciding whether what you're trying to claim is obvious. The first one is the result of what you're doing predictable. And if you simply went into the toolbox and combined a lot of different tools, it was probably the result of that net was probably predictable. You'd get what each of the tools individually gave you, and the result is it's likely to be obvious. Best example of that, or good example of that, is this old pavement case in the Supreme Court from now, oh God, almost 50 years ago. Somebody had a paving machine. Paving machines had two elements hanging on them, a spreader and a what the second one was. There were also somebody typically walking behind the paving machine with a radiant burner to keep the asphalt soft until the Steamroller could go over it and flatten everything out. So what did somebody do? He said, gee, we got room on this paving machine. Why don't we just hang the burner on it too? That way I don't have to walk behind. Great idea, Supreme Court said. Certainly more convenient, but not the type of thing that pat is patentable. Nothing new was added. Each of these always did exactly what they'd done before sequentially. When you get beyond combinations, you have to get a little different because if, once you're beyond a simple combination and you start combining more particularized elements, hydrogen and chlorine is an example, was there a reason in the prior art to combine those two? Was there a reason in the prior art, chemical, bio, or mechanical field to combine things? If there was a known reason, it may well be unpatentable too. And one of the things the Supreme Court did in KSR was to come up with a fairly long list of where you might find the possible reasons. They don't have to all be technological. Kids at Christmas want them. The design requires something of this type because what we're going to do before is not met by Greco-Roman architecture. There's an obvious benefit if we put these together. 
like it's more convenient to have everything hanging on the same machine. But if there's a reason to combine, that also indicates that something probably is not patentable. So again, when looking at both your patents, or what you might patent, and what somebody might assert against you, ask yourselves these two questions, and it may take you a long way toward deciding whether you should pay up on somebody else's patent or spend your own money to get a patent yourself. One of the real problems that the Federal Circuit saw was that of hindsight. Something always looks simple after the fact. And the Federal Circuit, in its way it decided cases, went to great lengths to try to eliminate hindsight bias. And that's important, because that's something you have to do. The statute, as you recall, talks about at the time the invention was, actually no longer was made, but at the time the application was filed. At the time it was filed, it was probably new. In hindsight, it's no longer new, and it can certainly seem, of course somebody should have done that. Be careful. And this is most important probably to you when you're trying to defend against a patent that claims something that in hindsight does look pretty damn simple. Second thing it did is, you know, there is no rule that says you can't get a patent on something that looks like this might be a good thing to try to see if it works. Smart people, people of ordinary skill, have got good reason to pursue all of the options. They're not sitting in cocoons. They're not automatons who have to be told exactly what they can do. If they've got reasons to do something and it reaches the result, it's probably ordinary skill. It was obvious to try. There's a fill-up on that to some extent. Was there a reasonable chance of success foreseeable? Because if there was no chance of success foreseeable, maybe it gets more and more likely to be non-obvious. The MPEP is the Patent Office's Manual of Patent Examining Procedure. If you're really having trouble sleeping over a month, you might try to read it. But the important things from this point of view is it tells you what the Patent Office tells an examiner to look at in deciding whether or not to give you a patent in the first place. And the ideas here are remarkably similar to what you saw in KSR. Predictable is underlined here about half, no, five or six times. Predictability is key. On the obvious to try, the Patent Office added that the KSR didn't specifically lay out that you've got to choose from a finite number of identified predictable solutions with the reasonable expectation of success. Where does that leave you? Where it probably leaves you with the Patent Office, if you look at its rules, that it is more likely to find something not obvious, if something is obvious to try, and in perhaps in some other areas, than a court would, particularly if it ever gets to the Supreme Court, of which the odds are very slim. I think we now have an obviousness over 50 years, maybe eight cases. But as I said, the important thing is to get out of the patent office. There's a slight tilt here in the patent office toward granting patents. And for the system to work, there probably has to be. If the patent office is tougher than any of the courts are, there probably are not to be some patents that ought to be granted that aren't. And at least at the patent office point of view, you probably need a slight tilt in that direction. Well, KSR focuses obviously on what's likely to be obvious. The big question is, what might not be? And there are a number of things here to look at. Have you included in your claim something that is really new? It just didn't exist before, or at least nobody knew about it before. The second is, does anything the prior art suggest that putting these pieces together would accomplish what it did? This is the unexpected result. 
there is often a situation in which you can find prior art that may tell you for one reason or another not to do this. That has to be taken into consideration in determining whether or not what you did, particularly when you got your result, was obvious. Could somebody have done it, at least without spending years and years in the lab? If it's extraordinarily difficult to do it and the prior art didn't really tell you enough about how to do it, it again is probably not obvious. Patent office again takes a remarkably similar approach. Could not have combined. If you can show that, you'll probably get a patent. Your combination doesn't merely do what the old pieces on the paving machine did added with the radiant burner. And the results were unexpected. Best example of this is probably U.S. v. Adams. In this case, it was decided the same day as Graham v. Deere. It involved a battery. And what was new about the battery was all you had to do to activate it was simply pour in water. You didn't need any acid or anything else, which most existing batteries did. And there's a story that when the man was trying the case at the Supreme Court, he had a glass of water, a glass. He poured water in it at the beginning. The light he had connected to it came on and stayed on throughout his argument, at which point he was fairly sure he'd won. So basically here, it was water activated, and all of the anode and cathode he used of the battery were individually old. There had been no suggestion to try them together, or frankly, you could try much of any pair together and get something that needed nothing other than water to activate it. It was also here a pretty neat teaching away. Defendant looked at the expert, got the real piece of prior art, Skrivnov's. And he tried to, because it basically had an anode and cathode that were essentially the same as Adams. But he ran into a problem. When he tried to put that battery together, it caught fire. At least the cathode caught fire, simply trying to make it. And when he put the whole thing together, it exploded. Adams had a fairly easy case. I hope some of you will have equally easy cases as you go forward. Let me finally turn to a couple of more recent Supreme Court, excuse me, Federal Circuit examples of cases where they found things not obvious. Orexo basically, this was trying to bring new medicine that would reduce opioid dependence. Unfortunately, it's not ruined to put most of the facts up here, but the fact of the matter is, abuse was a serious problem. How to resolve it was not. These people came up with a particular formulation, and there was something brand new in that formulation in which it was the first time, at least so far as the, any of the prior art told you, that they'd used anybody had used citric acid as a carrier particle. That was brand new, no teaching of it, and probably a correct conclusion at that point, as we go back a second, that no, using that was not obvious. That element itself was new. DSS I find a little more questionable. This is trying to save power in a computer system. Lots of pieces hanging off the server. The patent said, power them all down. Save power when you don't need them. Prior art taught, power down everything except the server. It didn't say except the server. It just taught powering all the peripheral stuff down. It strikes me that it's fairly commonsensical that if you want to save more power, you power down something else. But the Federal Circuit worked very hard to find that common sense didn't carry the ball, at least as far as the person trying to find the patent invalid was concerned. They really limited the use of common sense. You can read these and look through. You, you can't use it to supply a missing limitation, the idea to power down the service, unless the whole invention is unusually simple. Does that make much sense? Technology straightforward, overall technology, or simply throwing the switch to power down the server? 
And maybe the key to the case is that the patent defendant simply didn't supply enough evidence. But this case, these two cases indicate the Federal Circuit is willing to find patents valid. They're clearly finding a lot fewer patents valid than they did before KSR, but it's not a complete loss. Inventive step, this is the way Europe looks at it. And actually, Japan, Korea, and China, one of the reasons Japan, Korea, and China look at it is their patent systems all came out of the German system, and this was the way the German system looked at it. The biggest two differences here is the Europeans identify the closest prior art. There's no specific requirement that a patent office examiner here in the U.S. find a closest piece of prior art. He usually starts off with a particular patent and then adds to it, but there's nothing to say that that has to be absolutely the closest. There isn't a requirement in the U.S. to determine the objective technical problem. Other than that, the two systems are pretty much the same, and if you can get a patent under one of them, the odds are probably fairly good that you'll manage to get a patent under the other. Let's change subjects. This is, did you file a decent application? What's the specification of the patent supposed to have in it? Well, the specification is everything except the claims. It's all of the words before the claims, and it also includes the drawings. But what it's supposed to provide is basically three things. A written description of the invention. What did you invent? How do you use the invention? How do you make it? And have you told us this in enough detail so that anybody skilled in this art could use it. If not, you don't get a patent. There was a case I used to teach years ago where it looked very, very simple, except it required a wave generator that produced a thousands of hertz frequency wave. And as far as anybody could tell, nobody figured out how to do that yet. None existed. Very clear, the patent would work just fine if anybody had figured out how to come up with a million kilohertz cycle producer, but they haven't. So you, that clearly did not teach people. It's sort of like Jules Verne. He told you to go to the moon, but he didn't make it possible for you to do so. The last thing here is the so-called best mode. This is supposed to prevent you from hiding the ball from really not telling people how to use this invention. Because remember, the idea of a patent is to try to make this knowledge broadly enough available so people can use it and improve on it at least after your patent expires. Most recent act, the one of a few years ago, kept a best mode requirement, but it limited it to the patent office. You're required to disclose the best mode, but unless the examiner raises the question of did you, and the examiner practically never will because she doesn't have the foggiest notion what your best mode is, a defendant can no longer raise this defense in a lawsuit. How much lobbying it took to get that result, I don't know. Claims, we'll get back to in a second. Why do we have a written description requirement? Well, we want to know what the applicant had really invented. You've heard stories, and they are certainly true. I've done it myself. Sitting for a client with a patent application, looking at a competitor's new product, and trying to figure out how can I write a claim that covers this competitor's new product that is quite different from what I showed in my application that I filed maybe 15 years ago. Did I really invent what I would now like to claim so it covers this newer competitive product? Court asked, did I, quote, possess the invention? There's a problem here that often is not talked about. 
that a lot of what's in your specification, the applicant, the inventor, never claimed to have invented. It was background, it was old information that he or she simply used. When I was growing up doing this, my test for written description was usually, if I read the application, but stop before I get to the claims, do I know what the invention is? I defy you to do that with applications as they are being written today for the real reason that people have learned over the years of the Federal Circuit that if any time you say this is my invention, all it is going to do is limit what you can later claim. What the Federal Circuit and courts tend to do today is simply look at the new claim and see if you can find all of those words somewhere in the application. That's usually not a problem with claims that are originally filed because they count as part and typically the application itself talks about what the original claims say. But it gets to be a problem if you want to add something new or attack something different. The question is not does your original application make obvious what you now want to add, it's does, does it actually teach it? If all your original application teaches is chlorine, bromine might be perfectly obvious, but without that word chlorine in the original application, you can't claim it specifically. Maybe you'll get away with a halogen, which gets you into the problem of genuses versus species. What do you have to teach to be able to generically claim a halogen, to generically claim a hydrocarbon? Not an easily answered question, much easier in the mechanical field where people tend to recognize that nails and screws are roughly all part of the same genus, a lot harder when you get into chemistry and biochemistry. Suppose you claim a genus and there's a prior art patent out there you claimed halogens, that mentions chlorine. What happens to your genus claim? It's invalid because you claimed genus covered a previously disclosed species. But turn it around. Suppose, uh, you may suppose you basically want to claim halogen and all the disclosure is, you want to claim, excuse me, bromine and all the disclosure is, is a halogen. Now you may get the claim if you can show that there's something really special about using the particular species. Don't try to keep track of all of this now. You'll never be able to. But when somebody, patent attorney or one of your other people in your company talks to you about it, damn it, can I claim this? Can I generically claim something because I know there are other halogens that will work? What do I have to disclose? What do I have to do? Enablement and best mode. Does the patent enable you to practice? The question that often comes up is does the patent enable the full scope of the claim? That's always struck me as really a pretty bad question because we all know that a claim or you want a claim that's going to be infringed by improvements that you hadn't thought of yet, frankly nobody else had thought of yet. Go back to the steam engine and the, uh, compared to a modern uh, high powered gasoline engine. Claim on the steam engine could cover, a, as I think I said before, a cylinder, a piston that goes up and down inside of it and a couple of valves, an inlet valve and an outlet valve. Does that enable a supercharged mercury Mercedes engine? The answer is of course not. But should you nonetheless be able to cover somebody who uses what you invented? The answer is of course you should. So what does a patent have to enable? Well, it certainly has to enable you to create or practice a decent range of reciprocal piston engines. But not everything and certainly not everything that's added to that simple piston and cylinder arrangement to make something that's a newer and far better end product. Best mode, I think we just talked about, so we can skip it and continue to move ahead. Why 
do we have claims? They are, as you will recall, the art form, patent attorney's sonnet and poem that show up at the end of a patent application, end of a patent. Well, why do we have them? Well, unless there is some definition of what the patentee says its rights should be, places where it should have the right to exclude others, what is poor John Q. Public going to do? If you don't have claims, what have you done? You've left it to potential competitors to read a patent application and to somehow divine from that what I can do. Some prior systems in Europe used to come very close to doing that. It was not a satisfactory system because you gave no guidance. You gave no guidance to the public of what it could do, and you gave no guidance at all as to what the patentee really should be able to tell you you can't. The claim provides the only focus for the examiner to decide, should I allow something that has this scope? And for a court or a later review in the patent office to decide, is this claim valid in view of the prior art? Or finally, and this is limited to courts because the patent office doesn't care, as I've said about the answer, is this claim infringed? Unless the claim does what the statute requires, particularly points out and distinctly claims the subject matter of the invention, everybody's just wandering around in the fog with no idea where they're doing, what they're doing. I'm a little amused by the statutory requirement which the applicant requires as his invention. I will guarantee that if you ask a patentee to read a claim and say, is this what you invented? The answer is going to be, I don't know. Because these claims, frankly, are written by patent attorneys. They're written as part of back and forth in front of the patent office. So you spend a lot of time, if you're in litigation, saying to the patentee, of course this is what you regarded as your invention, isn't it? How good does it have to be? The Supreme Court finally stepped in on this a few years ago. And it said, frankly, it has to be good, clear enough. So if I read the patent, I read the prosecution history, which is all the backs and forths with the patent office as you're trying to get your patent, can I be reasonably certain what this Blumen invention is? Before Nautilus, the Federal Circuit's case was a claim was indefinite only if it was hopelessly ambiguous. I'd suggest that it was an example, again, of the Federal Circuit leaning farther toward protecting the rights of the patentee, which it historically does, than leaning toward protecting the rights of the patent. And just remember, you saw this claim before. Does this one meet the test? Does anybody who reads normal English conceivably understand what this means? And it's not a bad question to ask because this is really a pretty good claim. It has four or five steps to it, each of which is fairly carefully delineated. But they're written in a form. You notice the only period is at the end of this claim. It's ripe with semicolons. There's actually a colon in the middle of that penultimate paragraph. No teacher of English would ever let you turn this in and get away with it. But it probably does particularly point out and give the public notice of what Apple thought the invention was and what it basically sued Samsung about and that Samsung was found to have infringed. But it's not a simple question understanding what in heaven's name a claim really covers. A slight change. You have made an invention. There are a lot of different ways to claim it. Suppose that you were the first person to decide to put two wheels on a bike as opposed to a unicycle. You could claim it as a product. 
You can claim it. I make a bike by attaching two wheels to the frame. A bicycle having two wheels made by the process of. I could claim it in what's called a Jepsen fashion. This treats the two wheels in a seat as old. But I'm telling you what my improvement was. I added a brake. But if your invention was, and I'll slightly change it, to have a brake on uh, a bike that has two wheels and a seat, there are at least four ways there you could have claimed that invention. There's also a rather strange type of claim called a Markish claim, which tries to address the problem of how do you claim a genus when you really don't know what all the parts of it are? A halogen, suppose you might only want to claim two of them, here chlorine and fluorine. Why? A couple of reasons. Bromine and fluorine, or chlorine and fluorine were new in this scenario in which you were using them, but bromine wasn't. You can write this type of claim to exclude something that might otherwise be prior art. And in your fastener, if you're limited to nails, screws, and staples, maybe you can exclude glue if that's what somebody else was previously doing. Or maybe you're in a situation where, frankly, this is all you could think of. The examiner was giving you a hard time on simply claiming a fastener or a halogen, so you had to put in something to limit it. The most interesting type of claim is probably the so-called means plus function. What that means is, sorry for the use of the word, you have a claim that instead of calling for a fastener, calls for means for fastening things together. You have a radio receiver that talks about means for receiving a signal. What does that type of claim cover? Well, in Europe, that covers anything that performs the recited function. Supreme Court here decided, probably now 60 years ago, that that was too broad, that we weren't going to let you tie up any way of doing something because you discovered one particular structure that did it. And the result was this paragraph 6 in what's section 112 says you can claim part of a combination as a means, but it's going to be limited in scope. It's going to be limited in scope to what you actually disclosed in your patent and equivalence to what you disclosed that were known as of the time the patent was filed. In a couple of weeks, we're going to get into equivalence in an infringement context, and it looks at the same question, when are two things equivalent, but it looks at it at a different point in time, namely when the lawsuit came up. This applies only to combinations. You may want to try to avoid this limitation. You may be able to do so with a method claim. If you simply call for the method of fastening two members together as opposed to calling for means for fastening, Federal Circuit is going to find that that is not subject to this statutory limitation. They say the step of doing X is not a function means claim where the step of doing, for doing x, for the function is. You figure that one out. You may also be able to avoid this and get broader scope if you use a noun, a wireless device receiving a signal, rather than means for wirelessly receiving. This is going to be most important for your patent attorney to think about when he or she is trying to help you make sure that the claims they're seeking really covers what you want to cover, and arguably, and usually, frankly, what you're entitled to cover, and not getting caught up in language. Here's another slide you've seen before. What makes this claim you finally get worthwhile? Start you off, most important, you got it. As we saw a few minutes ago, the vast majority of claims never get to court. Once it's issued, it's presumed to be valid. And that is a tough presumption to overcome. I'll assume it covers a decent market, it covers what others are likely to do, and you can prove it's been infringed. But the most important thing, what makes it worthwhile? You've got it, 
And once you're in court, somebody has a real problem. If they want to prove that claim is invalid, they're clearly going to have to come up with prior art that is a lot better than anything the patent office found. So let's talk for a moment about what you can expect to find happening when you're trying to get this claim. The stool on the right is what your patent application disclosed. What did you claim? A sitting device having a surface spaced above the ground for a person to sit on. Patent examiner went into all the prior art. He found a log with both ends cut off, set up upright. He said, uh-uh. This prior art is covered by that claim. It anticipates that claim. Get lost. Well, like most persistent inventors with the help of their patent attorney, you decided not to get lost. So you amended the claim. You said my device has to have at least three legs that are below and support that surface on which people sit. What happened? You sent it in. And guess what? Patent examiner went back into the prior art. And what did he find? A three-legged metal stool. Guess what? That has everything here. Maybe it isn't exactly the same. He could have said anticipated. This time he just said it's obvious because he combined it with the old tree stump because patent examiners never like to throw away a piece of prior art once they've found it. So you kept trying. And this time you decided to really get specific. My seating device has a piece of wood. It's got a firm generally horizontal surface. Well, that stool was metal. Query whether the surface was firm. It's a fixed distance above the ground. What that added is a good question. And it's not three, it's got four legs. They're below, they're attached to, and they extend downwardly from and support the lower surface of the piece of wood. Compare that to your original claim. And the thing that really jumps out is how much more that original claim covers than the claim you finally got. And the question that has to raise for you is what do you think you invented? What do you want a patent? And how can you get a patent that covers not only your four-legged stool, but also this modern, thoroughly adjustable desk chair? Because frankly, you found the stool market is fairly limited. And if you look at Staples or anybody else's office supply house catalogs, you find there are all kinds of fancy desk chairs. How can you patent both of these? Because that's what you, or more than that, if you have the patent on the stool, how am I going to get a patent that will cover this desk chair? Well, you can try, but what you have to watch out for is a rule in the patent office that say you can't add anything new, new description to your patent application once you filed it. If you do, your patent's invalid. And there are a lot of things that may happen in the first couple of years after you've written your application that you wish you had really included. You've made improvements. You've got more experimental results. You've learned the specific percentages. You've learned that some step in a method that you indicated was pretty important really isn't. You probably can't make any of those changes in your existing patent application, even assuming you try to make them before the patent's issued, because once the patent issued, the claims and what it claims are really pretty well frozen. So what do you do? You file what we call a continuing application. Let's take, for example, the stool to begin with. You really didn't like that claim you finally got when you thought about it. So you asked, OK, can I simply take some pieces of that claim away so the claim is a little broader? If you have kept a copy of your original application pending, after the original one issued? The answer is yes. You can't amend the claims of the new, 
issued patent unless you want to go into reissue, and that's an entirely different story. But you can keep a continuing application, and they're often called continuations or divisions. There isn't really much difference between them. You don't add anything new to the patent specification, but you do go after different claims that are supported by the original application. And the important thing is that you keep the original filing date for prior art purposes. On the other hand, suppose you really do want to add something new. You want to add that that surface will swivel, which your stool won't. At least it won't swivel on the floor, but the seat is not going to swivel relative to the legs. You may want to add that it tilts. You can't add that to your original application, so you've got to file a new one. And it may be what we call a continuation in part. It simply adds all of this new description, but it keeps all the old stuff. So to the extent any claim is entitled to an early date, you haven't lost that. But the claims that include anything that you added, they are subject to a lot more potential prior art, because the prior art date moved from the day you filed your first application to the day, often several years later, that you filed the continuation in part. One of the things that is critically important in patents and claims is what in heaven's name do the words of the claim mean? And it gets to be more interesting because the patent office applies one set of rules when in examining a patent and a court applies a different set of rules in an infringement case. Let me just give you a couple of examples. If you remember that claim from a few back, let's go back and look at it. What's firm mean? Does it mean it doesn't have a pad on it? Or does it include the fabric cover on that desk chair? What does it mean to have the legs attached to the wood? Do they have to be directly attached? Or can they be indirectly attached the way they are on that chair? What's it mean that they have to extend downwardly from the surface? The legs on that desk chair, which are really short, for this, I guess this is five of them, when they come down, do go downwardly relative to the surface, but they don't go all the way up to the surface. Do they support the surface? Perhaps, yes. But how is an examiner going to read that claim? And how is a court going to read that claim? Examiner reading it when he's deciding to allow it will give all those words their broadest possible reasonable interpretation. He may well decide, you may well argue that firm simply means no pad. Query what a court will decide later because the only thing you disclosed was a hard piece of wood. Remember the examiner is trying to give it a broad interpretation, all these words, because you can still amend your claims at that point of time. And it's the examiner's job to require you to amend it if he thinks it's necessary to really distinguish the prior art or to provide the level of clarity that the public deserves in knowing what they can or cannot do. Once the patent has issued, nothing can be amended anymore. So the courts tend to take a rule that says, okay, I'm not gonna look at how might you talk about this claim, I'm gonna take a look at the big overall picture and ask the question, how would somebody who knows this field and who read everything you've got, your patent, your patent application, the claims, the early claims, the amended claims, and looked at all the prior art, what would he think or she think they mean? Would they think if you were suing the maker of that chair that firm covered a fabric seat, a stretchy fabric seat? And what about the legs? We'll get into this next session because after the patent issues,
the first subject up will be what infringes. See you then. <laughs>